Hello folks, Charlie Gipple here with a video of the week. With index products, whether IUL or index annuities, have you ever wondered how it is that insurance companies are able to give the consumers an interest rate based off of 100% of the growth in an index, say the S&P 500, up to a cap? How is it that insurance companies can do that when interest rates are so low? Or conversely, how is it that insurance companies are able to give zero of the down should the market tank say 30%? I'm going to answer that question today and in a quite simple format. I believe in it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And I think you'll see that common thread throughout all of my, uh, throughout all of my videos here that I do today. I'm also going to answer the question of, okay, if the market goes up 30% and if you have an IUL policy that has a cap of 12%, that caps out the client at 12%, who kept that excess? What happened to the excess? I'm going to answer those questions today that I know that many folks across the country, whether you're a newbie to index products or whether you're a veteran to index products, I do a lot of presentations a year and I know that this is a good, there's a good amount of ambiguity around this topic that I'm going to explain today. So maybe worth your 10, 11, 12 minutes today to check out this video. There is a chronological method to the madness. Uh, last, last week, I did a video on call options. What are call options? How do call options work? A little bit about put options as well. So you can check that out because I will talk about call options today. That's housed in my profile or on my YouTube channel, uh, as is all the previous videos that I've done here. So the insurance company gets a check from a consumer. That check is for $10,000. That consumer wants that policy that has a cap at 12%, let's say. S&P 500 annual reset cap at 12%. If the market goes up 12, the client gets 12 as an interest credit in that year. If the market goes up 20, the client gets 12 as an interest credit in that year. If the market drops 20%, the client gets an interest credit of zero in that year. Not negative 20%, but zero in that year, along of course with the cost of insurance charge, deductions, and all that stuff as well. But $10,000, how is it the insurance companies do that? Well, the insurance companies may take, say, let's say 95% of the client's money, $9,500. And by the way, I am generalizing a lot as I go through this presentation. Why? Because I think that I've found the right balance in getting technical enough for the salesperson that's watching this so that you know maybe more than what you did previously and you know enough so that well, you know enough so you can explain really how these things work to anybody. But yet the balance is, is not going so much into detail that I confuse the audience, right? So if you're an actuary, you may be saying, well, 9,500, no, you, you invest the whole $10,000 into the general account and then you buy and sell call options. You don't just buy call options, Charlie. I get all that. I just wanna make sure for the general audience, this is as simplified as possible. But yet at the same time, having the audience understand with 100% accuracy really how these products are designed. So let's say that $9,500 of that 10,000 or almost all of the $10,000, what does the insurance company do with that? Well, they invest that in their general account, right? And let's say that their general account is yielding around 5%. Technically, the average general account in the United States of America today for an insurance company is slightly less than 5%. LIMRA does studies on these uh, not very frequently. The last one I saw was like five years ago, but I do know that a little less than 5%, around mid fours is what the average general account yield is for insurance companies. So basically that client's premium or $9,500 is invested in the general account. That 5% is going to come in as income to the insurance company each and every year. By the way, if this was just a straight traditional UL policy that had a interest rate of say 5%, that consumer would basically see a 5% credit on their statement each year. Or the insurance company may take a 1% spread off the top of that and pass through that 4% to the consumer. So the reason I bring that up is the traditional fixed universal life policies and IUL policies, they're very close to the same thing, right? It's just a matter of what we do with that yield that's coming in each and every year. Point I wanna make real quick is with life insurance policies, the pricing of those policies many times, more times than not, are based off the entire general account yield of the insurance company, right? So that 
50 billion, 60 billion, 100 billion, 200 billion, depending on the insurance company, pool of investments from the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, etc., that's all pooled together that's getting a little less than 5% today, many life insurance products are based off of what that blended yield is. And by the way, you may be saying, well, 5%, that seems high based off rates today. That's correct because you have old bonds that are effectively propping up, so to speak, the general account yields of these insurance companies. As a matter of fact, the Moody's corporate triple A bond index today, as of this morning, is yielding 4.25%. But you have these old bonds within general accounts that are propping up the overall blended yield of the general account to, in my example, let's say 5%. Technically, it's, around, it's between mid and upper fours is what the average general account yield in the United States is today. But that's how life insurance policies are priced. More cases than not, with annuities, they are actually priced off new money rates, which means that instead of the whole general account yield, we may be looking at new money. If we were to go out and invest today, annuities many times may be priced at, say, 4%. That is the first of a couple reasons why annuities have less caps than life insurance. And then there's, there are two sides to the coin, right? I'm going to explain the other side here in a bit. In short, annuity products typically don't have expenses as high as life insurance. So my point is, is not that annuities are worse than life insurance, just completely different, right? So that's annuities. Put that in the side in the back of your mind for now. Let's talk more about life insurance. We have not spent all the client's money yet, right? We still have $500 because we did not, with 9,500, we put it in the general account. What about the other $500? Well, that is where the insurance company goes to an investment bank and they buy a hedge, right? They buy a call option. The insurance company says, okay, so we have a value of $10,000. And on that notional value of $10,000, here's what we want to do. We want to buy a call option, an S&P 500 call option. We'll give you $500. And with that call option, XYZ uh, investment bank, we want you to give us everything the market does to the upside. Give us everything the market does to the upside. The investment bank comes back and says, well, but you only have $500. We will give you everything the market does to the upside up to 12%, but we're not going to give you everything the market does to the upside. So we say, okay, here's $500. We will buy that call option. Technically, we buy and sell call options which nets out to a cost of $500 in my example. But again, I want to keep it simple. $500, we buy that call option. And what do we do with that 12% that the investment bank gave us as an upside limit? We call that a cap and we put that in the client's contract, right? That client has a cap of 12%. My point here is, is based off of our call option budget, it is not just the insurance company that sets the caps, right? It is also dependent upon what we can buy with that investment bank with, say, $500. And they gave us a cap in that year, effectively, of 12%, right? So if the market goes up 12%, the consumer gets 12%. If the market goes up 20%, the consumer gets 12%. The investment bank never gave the insurance company anything more than 12%. That excess, it never happened. The agent didn't keep the excess. The insurance company didn't uh, keep the excess. It never happened. Conversely, what happens if the market tanks? Here is the risky part to call options. As I mentioned last week in my previous video, call options are extremely risky because if the market tanks, you lose or the insurance company loses 100% of their investment, right? But question, is 100% of the insurance company's investment really 100% of the insurance company's investment? No, because we have this $9,500 over here working for us getting 5% each year coming in, right? So what does the insurance company do with that 5% or roughly $500 coming in each and every year? Well, at the end of every year, that call option is gonna expire worthwhile, as in the market goes up, or worthless, as if the market goes down. So we need to replenish this each and every year, right? So that's where $500 year two, $500 year three, $500 year four, and so forth. That is what funds the call option budget year after year after year. And again, if this was just a straight fixed product, that 
or somewhere around there would just go through to the client on their statement, they would see that as a fixed rate. But many consumers find that the trade-off of sacrificing this in order to get upside of say 12%, that many times it's worth it, especially considering how these things have performed over the last 20 year period of time since their inception in 1997, right? They perform pretty well and that trade-off has been worth it. Another difference between index annuities and index life insurance is index annuities, which started with a call option, but or with a yield of 4%, those insurance companies may have to carve off, say, minus 1% so that they make money as well, right? The insurance company is doing this for a profit. They may want to shave 1% off the top. Well, 4% minus 1, we're looking at a call option budget of maybe 3% versus with life insurance, a call option budget of 5%. You may be saying, well, then how does the insurance company make money? They're not carving anything off the top. Some of them can carve some off the top and get a spread, like we do on the annuity side, like the insurance companies do on the annuity side. But the insurance company is not 100% reliant on that spread income. Why? Because with life insurance, there is also the big three of expenses I talked about in one of my previous videos, right? COI charges, per thousand charges, premium loads. So in other words, this does not represent 100% of the insurance company's income, like in some cases, in many cases, that would be the case with annuities. So in short, we have a bigger call option budget for a couple different reasons with life insurance than we do annuities, right? You may have caught this earlier. You may, you may have said, well, but that 5%, what if it's not 5% going forward? I would guess that in 90 some percent of the boardrooms across the country with insurance companies, they are discussing the risk of this 5% becoming watered down year after year after year after year. Why? Because those 1980 bonds are being spun out, right? They're being paid off, they're gone. And incoming, uh, the incoming new bonds are effectively watering down, they will eventually water down the weighted average yield of those general accounts. This is a risk. It's a real risk, which means that that 5% could go down to 4.5%, right? And a $450 call option budget is going to give the consumer less of a cap, all else being equal, less of a cap than a $500 call option budget, right? So that is a risk, but it is no more a risk with IUL. I guess I'll it's somewhat no more of a risk with IUL as it is with current assumption universal life insurance, right? If you were getting 5% before, well, you have the risk of that 5% going to 4.5% or going to 4%, right? It is, for the most part, no more of a risk for IUL than it may be for whole life insurance and the dividends that the consumers get year after year after year. In short, IUL is not better than annuities, it's not better than current assumption, it's not better than whole life. We're all faced with kind of the same issue. You know, all these products are faced with the same issue of eroding general account yields as time goes by. But the bottom line is, it's clarity around how these products are priced. They are very, very good products for the right consumer. Life insurance is a beautiful thing. The fact that if a consumer passes away, they could have paid pennies relative to the dollars that come out of life insurance to go to their heirs. Life insurance is a magical thing. Index universal life insurance, it's a magical thing, but can be confusing. And hopefully I clarified some of that confusion today. If you like this video, again, like it, share with your friends. Uh, if you have comments, whether positive or negative, constructive criticism, feel free to post. Just understand I simplified a lot of this stuff. And also understand there is a chronological method to the madness. Check out my previous videos if some of this didn't make sense, and it likely will make sense after those previous videos. Thanks again for your time and have a good week.